Hi, today I want to bring you up to date with the print and also to talk to you a little bit about um, editioning. I've had a couple of questions about editioning and I just want to share them with you. So first of all, to go to the print, since um, I showed you last, I have added a layer of white to the print. So in the last video, I was showing you inking up the, the white cloud in the sky. And after I'd done that, I cut away the cloud completely. And then I printed an opaque layer of white ink onto the landscape. So completely flat layer of white colour. So one of the a couple of things to discuss here. First of all is have a look at the difference between that white layer of opaque ink compared to the extended white ink on the sky. This is a good example of where extenders doing that job of making the print more realistic. The, the cloud is vaporous and transparent and the land is starting to look solid. So the other thing to notice is, and I hope this shows up on the film, that there's a slightly grey blue tint to the white ink here, which isn't apparent in the ink on the foreground. Now, if you watched my film where I was sort of discussing my plans for the print and the order that I was going to print in, one of the things I spoke about was the fact that the um, printing of the blue sky would have an impact on the white ink going over the top, which indeed it has, and that's absolutely fine by me. Um, it's helping to push those mountains back. Now, if I come onto the foreground bit here, which has, this is the first inking, that layer of white ink is the first inking of the foreground. Couple of things. First of all, you'll notice that the tree here, I've, I've not printed the whole of the tree, all those little fine branches. What I've done is I've inked up and then I've wiped away the white ink I didn't want to print where all the detail is. If you remember me talking about um, fine detail, if you can avoid printing fine detail until you actually get to the colour layer you want the fine detail to be printed in, you will get a much crisper result. So I don't actually want any white there, so I'm not going to print it now. The other thing is that it's still quite ethereal down here and, and um, it's not opaque enough for me, so I'll probably put another layer of white ink on that area to make it bolder. Now, this is something that I quite often do where I, I will double ink rather than putting one thick layer of ink on. I'd rather put two thin layers of ink and keep everything crisp than risk things getting blobby because I've put a thicker layer on. Again, this is going back to Japanese woodblock printing where the idea of double, print, double printing to build up layers of colour is quite common. So probably two layers of white on the foreground without um, actually cutting anything away. So double layer there. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some shadows onto the far hill. So let me show you the block. So I can just swap that out and just put that somewhere safe. So if we go to the block now you'll see that I have been at the inking up again with the paintbrush and this time I was using um, I was actually using watercolour but black and um, again you don't have to use watercolour any gouache children's poster paint something cheap and cheerful is absolutely fine. The reason I was using black in this instance is because the bit that I'm going to cut away now is the bright white snow where it's lying sort of in the hollows and these darker bits are going to represent the sort of darker areas where the sort of spines of the hills are and more in the background. Now it's really important to say that I'm not going to print this this dark. We're still, in terms of the, the inking, going to be a pale bluey grey. So that's one of the things you kind of have to get your head around with this technique is thinking, visualising the print as a different colour maybe from 
what it looks like on the block. So um, yeah, this is going to be very pale when I print it, although it looks very dramatic here. So in uh, the next video or the one after that, I will show you some more cutting because there seems to be a real appetite for watching that. So we'll try and do some close ups of me cutting this area out for you. So now I want to answer a couple of questions about editioning that I've had. And can I just say about questions? Really lovely to hear questions and thank you very much for engaging with me making these films and it's fascinating to hear what you're interested in so please do that. It's probably best if you've got a question to use social media to ask questions. I have been getting emails and messages and the problem is that I'm still running a business and I'm not, um, I'm self-employed so I'm not sort of furloughed or anything so I'm not sort of sitting here with nothing to do. I'm, I'm actually we're, we're pretty busy so I can't answer emails personally individually but I will anybody who asks stuff that is useful to everybody I will certainly try and address in these films so you know please don't be offended if I haven't got back to you it's not because I don't want to it's because I can't um, so to go back to editioning somebody was asking how many of my prints I'm making so this print here that we're working on in these films, I am printing, I have 15 pieces of paper. Because this is a reduction, if you're new to this, just to remind you, with reduction printing, you have to print all the prints from day one because there's no going back. You're destroying the block as you're cutting. So with this, there are 15 sheets of this Kitakata paper that I'm working on. And if I'm very lucky, at the end of it, I will have an edition of 15 prints to sell. However, usually when I work, I have what I would call a sacrificial print. So one print at the beginning of the edition that I, I use to make colour changes and things. So I'll print a colour and then I, if I don't like that colour, obviously the first one is my tester and then I'll make changes. So... Um, hopefully 15 prints, but more likely 14. And sometimes things can go wrong, especially with something like this, because the whole basis of this print is the immaculately clean paper. So if I mess up and get a blotch of any sort or a thumbprint on the paper, I can't then sell the print. So um, yeah, 15, cross your fingers for me. Somebody else was asking about the variable quality of these because I've been doing shadings in the sky um, somebody said well they won't all be identical so how do you manage that in an addition now with something like the shading in the sky this this particular print that I'm making is not going to be variable there will be tiny differences but that's because I'm hand printing and my attitude is always the beauty of prints is in the hand printing. If you want it identical, then get a laser print and, and then that's absolutely fine. I'm invested in the hand process and there will be tiny variables. So this is an addition and there won't actually be a noticeable difference between all of them. However, I don't always work like that. So I've got an example to show you here. So this is a print called Veil Raking Light. It's called Veil because it's Aylesbury Vale, which is kind of uh, close to where I live. And this one has got a very um, painterly sky. So when I was inking this, I was using lots of little rollers with different colours and I was more or less painting on the block. And you can see that there are changes of colour within this. And actually, this is also a really nice example of when you can add texture from the roller. So I don't know, hopefully you can see here, there's sort of almost speckles in the sky. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get Ben to focus on that one. And in my video where I was inking up the cloud, I was talking about the fact that you could you could add texture with a roller 
you know, the more you work the roller onto the liner, the smoother the inking. And normally that's a really good thing. But occasionally, if you just deposit, allow the roller, so your sort of your hand is loose and you just let the roller drop onto the lino, then it will deposit the ink. And here it's depositing texture. So there's almost this like spotty quality to it, which is quite nice um, here. So this, this print um, is very variable. So it's a sort of variable edition, if you like. There are 14 in the edition, but they are all quite different, really. So what I do is I call it an edition, but we photograph each print. And then when clients get in touch to buy, we will show them the photographs and let them choose whichever one they like. And one of the things that's really interesting about this and quite a good lesson for printmakers, I think, is that when people choose from a variable edition with me, they never ever or very seldom go for the one that I would choose. Because when I look at this, I'm looking at the registration, I'm looking at the inking and all that kind of stuff. And so I bring all that technical worry and concern to the print when I'm choosing it. Whereas the client is just thinking, oh, I like that one. It's got more blue in it or whatever. So that, that's kind of good um, for printmakers. And the other thing about this one, while I've got it in front of you to talk about, is going light over dark. So all this pale green in the foreground and the, the highlights up the tree, that's all done on top of the dark ink. So this is oil-based ink. Um, this is Cranfield's ink, like I've been using on the other print. And here I've inked the tree very, very dark, and then I've simply dropped in the green. If you want to go light over dark, the thing you've got to remember is that you will always, the colour will always be knocked back by the dark underneath. So mix your light colour brighter and lighter than you think you need, because you'll lose some of that. So the final thing about editioning is that I do occasionally do prints where um, I do completely different colours for each print. So if you go to my website and have a look in my gallery, look at the Near Applecross series, and those are one-offs. They're, they're mono prints. They're the same cutting, but completely different colours. So I count those as not an edition. They're just one-offs. Um, and the final thing I'll say before I go, which was a piece of advice that, that um, a very sort of venerable member of the Royal Society of Painter Printmakers said to me that during a conversation about this business of editioning and things being identical and variable. And he said that not to worry too much about it because the people buying the print are never the people who are worried about the whole edition being identical or following the rules. And... I would back that up. I've never had any problem about variable, um, slight variations in an edition, variable editions or one-offs. It's never been a problem. So um, I don't worry about it. So thank you for joining me for this and I hope you'll watch the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye.